Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Petoskey. I am Cliff Dene and am honored to welcome you here this morning. Our pastor, Ryan Donahoe, had planned to be on a humanitarian trip to Cuba this weekend, but Cuba decided at the last minute to ban flights coming into their country from the United States. Ryan hopes to complete the trip as soon as he is able. As we begin our time of worship, we always begin with these words. This is a Christian worship service, and because it is a Christian worship service, everyone is welcome here, and our doors are open to all people. So let us worship the Lord. From God comes my salvation. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. God alone is my rock and my salvation. God is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. Trusting in the promise of grace, let us pour out our hearts before God. Forgiving God, we repent of all the ways we turn from you. You call, but we do not listen. You show us your path, but you prefer your own way. Forgive us, heal us, and lead us back to you, that we might show mercy to others. In Jesus' name we pray. God has loved you from the beginning of time. 
God's arms are always open to welcome you home. The door to forgiveness never closes. All of us are being called to a life of compassion, healing, and grace. So live in the knowledge that you are forgiven, you are loved, you are blessed beyond all human understanding. Amen. Jesus, I've forgotten the words that you have spoken, promises that burn within my heart have now grown dim with a doubting heart I follow the paths of earthly wisdom. Forgive me for my unbelief, renew the fire. Please pray with me. Speak to us your word, O God, that we may hear Jesus' call to be his disciples. Amen. A reading from the book of Jonah. One day, long ago, God's word came to Jonah, Amittai's son. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. But Jonah got up and went the other direction to Tarshish, running away from God. He went down to the port of Jobah and found a ship headed for Tarshish. He paid the fare and went on board, joining those going to Tarshish as far away from God as he could get. But God sent a huge storm at sea, the waves towering. The ship was about to break into pieces. The sailors were terrified. They called out in desperation to their gods. They threw everything they were carrying overboard to lighten the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down into the hold of the ship to take a nap. He was sound asleep. The captain came to him and said, What's this? Sleeping? Get up! Pray to your God. Maybe your God will see we're in trouble and rescue us. Then the sailors said to one another, Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's draw straws to identify the culprit on this ship who is responsible for this disaster. So they drew straws. Jonah got the short straw. They th then they grilled him. Confess. Why this disaster? What is your work? Where do you come from? What country? What family? He told them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship God, the God of heaven who made the sea and land. At that, the men were frightened, really frightened, and said, What on earth have you done? As Jonah talked, the sailors realized that he was running away from God. They said to him, What are we going to do with you to get rid of this storm? By this time, the sea was wild, totally out of control. Jonah said, Throw me overboard, into the sea. Then the storm will stop. It's all my fault. I'm the cause of the storm. Get rid of me, and you'll get rid of the storm. But no. The men tried rowing back to shore, they made no headway. The storm only got worse and worse, 
wild and raging. Then they prayed to God, O oh God, don't let us down because of this man's life, and don't blame us for his death. You are God, do what you think is best. They took Jonah and threw him overboard. Immediately the sea was quieted down. The sailors were impressed, no longer terrified by the sea, but in awe of God. They worshipped God, offered a sacrifice, and made vows. Then God assigned a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the fish's belly for three days and nights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you and so good to be together. Uh, you're probably getting tired of these Zoom things, but uh, pretty soon, we hope, pretty soon in the next several months, uh, when we all get our vaccines, we'll be able to do it in person again. I'm so looking forward to that. Probably most of you are as well. So the book I have this morning to share with you is called The Runaway Bunny. I'll bet some of you have already had your mom and dad read this to you, or maybe you've read it yourself. This is a story about a, a bunny who wants to run away from home. So I'm going to read it and then show you the pictures. Some of the pictures are very cool. Once there was a little bunny who wanted to run away. So he said to his mother, I am running away. If you run away, said his mother, I will run after you, for you are my little bunny. And there's the beginning of the story. If you run after me, said the little bunny, I will become a fish in a trout stream, and I will swim away from you. If you become a fish in a trout stream, said his mother, I will become a fisherman and I will fish for you. I like this picture, it's all in color. There's the mama fishing for her little boy. If you become a fisherman, said the little bunny, I will become a rock on the mountain high above you. If you become a rock on the mountain high above me, said his mother, I will be a mountain climber and I will climb to where you are. Here it is in color. His mother's climbing the mountain after him. If you become a mountain climber, said the little bunny, I will be a crocus in a hidden garden. If you become a crocus in a hidden garden, said his mother, I will be the gardener and I will find you. Oh, doesn't this picture make you... Think about spring and all the flowers. That's a serious looking mother though. If you are a gardener and find me, said the little bunny, I will be a bird and fly away. If you become a bird and fly away from me, said his mother, I will be a tree that you come home to. If you become a tree, said the little bunny, I will become a little sailboat and I will sail away from you. If you become a sailboat and sail away from me, said his mother, I will become the wind and blow you where I want you to go.
If you become the wind and blow me, said the little bunny, I will join a circus and fly away on a flying trapeze. If you go flying on a flying trapeze, said his mother, I will be a tightrope walker and I will walk across the air to you. If you become a tightrope walker and walk across the air, said the bunny, I will become a little boy and run into the house. If you become a little boy and run into a house, said the mother bunny, I will become your mother and catch you in my arms and hug you. After the cold night last night, that fire looks pretty welcoming, doesn't it? Shucks, said the bunny. I might just as well stay where I am and be your little bunny. And so he did. Have a carrot, said the mother bunny. Looks pretty snuggly, doesn't it? The end. Well, I hope you enjoy the runaway bunny. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad he decided to come back home. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, there are days when many of us feel like running away. But where would we go? Even mothers and fathers have problems they can't seem to quickly solve. Thank you, Jesus, for always being at my side to help me when I struggle with problems too. Even though I can't see you, somehow I know you are here and will always love me forever. Amen. Let us open with prayer. Dear Lord, we come here this morning to be refreshed by your words and find truths that will guide us in responding to the needs of today as they are revealed. Amen. This scripture passage, as we've heard in today's reading, involves Jonah and three cities, Nineveh in northwestern Assyria, Joppa on the southwestern coast of Israel, and Tarshish, likely located in what is now southern Spain. If we, if we look at a map at that time, we'll soon notice that Tarshish and Nineveh are in opposite directions. Nineveh was the capital of, of Assyria at that time. Today, that region includes Iraq, Syria, and a part of Turkey. Assyria was Israel's enemy. A commentary from the New International Version of the Bible states that, quote, no one deserved God's favor less than the people of Nineveh. Jonah wanted nothing to do with them. The town of Joppa was on the southeastern coast of Israel, where Jonah hoped to find a boat sailing for Tarshish, which was his destination. He planned to escape God's directive to go to Nineveh to preach to them to repent and change their wicked ways. Jonah hoped to hide there. Modern scholars disagree as to the exact location of Tarshish, but many place the town, as I mentioned before, in southern Spain. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Richard Nelson Bowles, the author of the book entitled What Color Is Your Parachute, told this story in a seminar I took with him a number of years ago. Quote, Before we were born, God took us out to lunch and told us why we were being sent to earth, 
what our mission here would be. But after we were born, we forgot what God told us. And many of us have spent years trying to remember. I would suggest that Jonah apparently was one of those who forgot. And Mary Oliver, the wise and prolific poet, wrote these words. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. If we have young children or grandchildren, we are likely familiar with the beloved story I read to the children a short while ago. The runaway bunny was a little boy who was unhappy for reasons we are never told. It has been considered a classic for many years. Our children, Nathaniel and Emily, loved the story and asked for it repeatedly while they were growing up. Readers aren't told why the bunny is unhappy. We never really find out. He just is. But what we do know is that in the end, the bunny gives up his attempts and accepts his mother's offer to nestle in her arms and nibble on the carrot his mother offers him. Like the runaway bunny, Jonah is also trying to run away. But this time we know why. He wants to escape from responsibility. He wants to run away because he doesn't want to do what God is asking him to do. Have you ever wanted to run away from God? I have. After our son Nathaniel died, I ran away from God as far and fast as I could. I felt betrayed, and my heart was full of rage. How could the God I had known all my life not send someone to save him and his friend from drowning? My rage simmered day after day. Exercise seemed to alleviate some of the pain for a short while. I walked incessantly. I jogged on our walking path around our home at that time. One morning, though, tired of my routines, I walked out to our pole barn and started splitting firewood until I was exhausted, panting and covered with sweat. I threw my splitting ball on the ground, disgusted at my feeble attempt to feel better. I stumbled into Nathaniel's side of the barn and surveyed car parts, motorcycle engines, an ice cream freezer, homemade luges, several bicycles in various states of being rebuilt, and a and a sea of mysterious metal parts that I would never be able to identify. This part of the barn was Nathaniel's workshop, and now he was gone. I screamed out his name, hoping beyond hope that he would somehow answer me. Of course, there was no response. I read endless grief recovery books, but it was Rabbi Harold Kushner's book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, that helped me understand that bad things can and do happen to anyone at any time for unknown reasons. And importantly, maybe most importantly, that God doesn't pick on us or abandon us ever. Sometimes though, we abandon him. We don't know what else to do. We look for someone to blame and God is an easy target. Kushner's son died of old age when he was just 12 years old chronologically. Who can any of us blame for something like that? Like Rabbi Kushner and Mary Oliver, life, not God, had handed me a box of darkness too. It was up to me to find the light hiding inside it. This wasn't an assignment I wanted anything to do with. Nonetheless, Understanding its therapeutic value and responding to my heart, I started writing late one August afternoon, not knowing where my writing would take me. Nathaniel had been gone over four months. It wasn't a voice exactly that had started speaking to me. It was more like something or someone tugging at my heart. I was still working full time as a professional counselor at the time of Nathaniel's death. But now my own heart was broken. Who will heal the healer, I wondered. And how? Maybe me? 
with help from others? Of course, maybe it was time for this healer to start healing himself. Over the next four years, two books of meditations were born, one for men who tend to run away from their grief, and the other for parents who have lost a son or daughter. In some mysterious fashion that I cannot explain, God, I am convinced, was at work through my hands, feet, and hearts of family and friends who had come looking for me to draw me out of my own box of darkness. Thomas Merton, while living in England in his younger years, planned to write novels, but after the deaths of two family members in London during World War II, Merton moved back to America and was ordained a Trappist monk. Instead of writing novels, Merton became a world-renowned spiritual writer, theologian, mystic, poet, social activist, and scholar of comparative religion. And years after his death, his writing continues to heal untold numbers of souls. What voice freed Merton from his box of darkness? When it became obvious to Jonah that God was calling him to preach in Nineveh, a pagan stronghold in the north, he ran south in the opposite direction toward Joppa, away from the northern city that God had asked him to convert. Instead, in Joppa, Jonah boarded a ship that was sailing for Tarshish. The ship was soon caught in a storm. Jo Jonah's frightened shipmates tossed him overboard, hoping that his God would save all of them from drowning. When Jonah hit the water, the sea calmed down. Then, as the story goes, Jonah ends up in the belly of a whale for three days and nights. Three days and nights would give any, excuse me, three days and nights in darkness would give any of us a lot of time for reflection and reconsideration of earlier decisions. Jonah concludes that if he lives, he will go to Nineveh after all. He finally understood that God would not let him go. Who among us has not found him or herself in the belly of a metaphorical whale in a similar box of darkness? Eugene Peterson, the author of the Message Study Bible, writes about Jonah's situation this way. This is deadly serious. And I'm quoting, This is deadly serious. While we are smiling or laughing at Jonah, we drop the guard with which we are trying to keep God at a comfortable distance, and suddenly we find ourselves caught in the purposes and commands of God, all of us, no exceptions. Here is someone on our level. Even when Jonah does it right, like preaching finally in Nineveh, he does it wrong by getting angry at God. But the whole time, God is working within and around Jonah's very ineptness and accomplishing his purposes in him. Most of us need a biblical friend or two like Jonah, Peterson concludes. After the whale vomits Jonah onto the shore, his new perspective kicks in. Peterson continues, This is the center of the story, the pivotal place where Jonah turned to God. This is where he became what God called him to be. And it's where you and I become what God has called us to be as well. The author Mimi Redfern adds, you have to put it out there. You know things. You have gifts you're not using. You have too much to give to waste it. Don't hide it and don't be afraid. Jonah took his skills out of hiding the folks in Nineveh, approximately 120,000 strong, ended up repenting. And Peterson adds an element of healing assurance as well. Quote, grieved, we humble ourselves before God and repent. That is when a great reversal takes place. Where we are expected judgment, we experience grace. Along with it, we experience something else the goodness of God. And we find that all along, God wasn't out to get us, but rather to gather us into his arms. Finally, these encouraging words from Nelson Mandela, 
a man who had every right to be hopeless, but instead chose to forever be filled with faith in God and hope for a better future. Mandela's words, he said, you are a child of God. Your playing small will not serve the world. There is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in every one of us. And Jesus assures us with these words, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. He was speaking to all of us. Then and now, this morning, Jonah, the Bible's runaway bunny, came out of hiding. We can too, into God's waiting and loving arms and into the world's endless needs. Your love for others can move mountains of despair. Thank you for reaching out in any way you can. Amen and amen. I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Who shall I send? Please pray with me. In our response this morning to these prayers, God of grace, hear our prayers. God of new visions, we pray for people highly placed in power that they may focus their eyes on you. God of grace, hear our prayers. And we pray for the lowly victims of power that they may also focus their eyes on you. God of grace, hear our prayers. We pray for those who bless with their lips, but curse with their mouths, including ourselves. God of grace, hear our prayers. We pray for those that are ill and those facing the end of life. God of grace, hear our prayers. 
Give them the gift of prayer that they may pour out their hearts to you. God of grace, hear our prayers. We pray for the church and its leaders that we may hear and respond to your call to be fishers of people. God of grace, hear our prayers. Rock of our salvation, through Christ and your Holy Spirit, bring us into the new world that you are shaping, even as this world is passing away. God of grace, hear our prayers. And now let us join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God is our rock and our fortress. Let us celebrate our salvation by fearlessly giving a portion of what has already been given to us. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have saved us for a purpose. We dedicate these gifts as we dedicate our lives to you, that you will make us fishers of people. Amen. Good morning. Just a few announcements for you this morning. First, as always, um, following worship today, we have lift time on Zoom. And then at noon, we gather for a time of prayer. Also be checking your mail this next week for a postcard coming from us with exciting news about tours of the renovations. We can't wait to get everyone in to see everything that has happened. It won't be totally finished by then, but we couldn't wait any longer for that. Also, we have plans underway for us to gather safely back in the sanctuary in February. And then finally, on February 7th, we will be shifting our 
uh, worship video over to YouTube only and that's because Facebook has made some changes and with some new technology we have in the sanctuary um, and so you can go to Petoskey Presbyterian and YouTube and subscribe to that page and you'll be notified of every time that we go live so and we also have it set up so that we can continue to comment during the worship services that is a way that we can stay in touch with one another Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. In this new year, and on this new day, and as our nation takes a new direction, all of us will be required to offer our assistance within our own families and within our own neighborhoods and with our, within our own cities to help spread the message of love and reconciliation and tolerance so, as Pastor Ryan always says each Sunday, you know what to do. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to that which is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. And may the peace of Christ, the love of God, and the sweet, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen and amen. <laughs>